Looks like we got ourselves a clue style Mexican standoff. This is gonna be so much fun. Hello and welcome back to another Midnight Showing. As always, I'm Kelly, and I just got out of The Hateful Eight. This is the eighth film by director and writer Quentin Tarantino, and possibly his last if interviews are to be believed. God, I hope that's not true, but it may inevitably be so. Now, for those who don't want spoilers, here's the skinny. This movie is 100% worth seeing in theaters. If you can, go see it on the biggest screen possible. Don't go to one of the small theaters because you're doing yourself a disservice. Most of this movie is just shot so beautifully in such a wide format that by God you need to go see it in the biggest theater possible. IMAX preferably, but well, let's face it, most of those are still being taken by Star Wars at the moment and you're probably not going to find it. On top of which, this did come out the week after Christmas, which is actually noticeably a lot slower than most other weeks, so they might just shove it in one of your smallest theaters just so they can say that it was there. But if you can, absolutely go see it. The dialogue is so engaging that you don't even notice that the first two hours is nothing but dialogue, and they only take their first shot after the third act. But that's basically Quentin Tarantino in a nutshell. If you watch any of his movies, most of them are just dialogue. And then he has a big old freak out at the end. And truth be told, if this movie and Django and Chain are any proof, if he did nothing but westerns for the rest of his career, I would love to watch every single one of them because he does them beautifully. Yes, this film was filmed in 70mm, non-digital editing, and by God does it show, and it is awesome. Every single face explosion, everything is practical, and it's quite clear that this was meant as a dialogue piece more than anything else. For those who want spoilers, let's go on. So what's the plot of this movie? Well, it turns out that Kurt Russell, being John the Hangman Ruth, is escorting a high-value bounty to the hangman's noose. When, on his mountain path, he comes across Samuel L. Jackson, a fellow bounty hunter named Marcus Warren, I think. I'm going to have to IMDB that later. And he is stuck in the wilderness with six bounties of his own that are all dead. And he needs help because his horse died and the snowstorm is coming. So, John ends up helping him out. Attaching his bounties to the top of his carriage and moseying on to the next rest stop. Along the way, they come across the sheriff of the town that they're heading towards. And they offer him a ride too. They get to the rest stop to find five other people there. But someone's not who they say they are. And things start happening. And by things, I mean mostly they get in pissing matches until someone poisons the coffee, which is about, oh, an hour and a half into the film. As I said, most of this movie is just dialogue. And you don't really see any action until the hour and 20... The hour and 45 minute mark has already passed. This is a three hour movie, people, and you don't even notice. I seriously got my theater at like 145 and I was so shocked to see that when I got out that it was almost five o'clock. I didn't even think, it doesn't feel like it's that long. Unlike something like, say, Interstellar, where I felt that last hour because of my butt hurting so bad. You don't feel... That this movie, you don't feel that with this movie because you're on the edge of your seat the entire time. You are 100% engaged and they're doing it strictly through talking. But with that said, if you're not really into those talking movies a lot, you're going to have a problem with this one. That's kind of a prerequisite when you go into a Quentin Tarantino film. You have to want to see a lot of talking. And this film is no exception. And it's very engaging. It's funny. It's time period accurate, which was really weird. They talk about some very intriguing things, and 
it does get into the dark territory that Quentin Tarantino is really known for. And while they're talking, you really get the idea that none of these guys are good. Every single one of them has a problem. So you have Kurt Russell, who is the hangman. He's a bounty hunter who takes people to the hangman's noose. He doesn't ever shoot his charges. He actually does the hard work to catch them and drag their ass from point A to point B so that they can hang. Why? Because evil bastards need to hang. And people need to hang evil bastards. That's really his only really reason. Never mind that bounties could be inaccurate and the people could be innocent and he's sending innocent people to hangman since he doesn't give a crap about that. His job is just to get them from point A to point B. Then you have Samuel L. Jackson's character who is a bounty hunter, former Union soldier of the Civil War who kills all of his charges. <laughs> and... Yeah, he's done some pretty bad shit if his backstories are to be believed. Both wartime, non-wartime, and even in Aftermath when he was out in the middle of fucking nowhere. Yeah, he's done some pretty sick shit. We might talk about that in a minute, though. The Sheriff is a former Confederate racist who's constantly bickering with Samuel Jackson the entire movie trying to pick fights and reasons to shoot the bastard yeah none of these guys are good so who are the other people inside of the cabin with them well you've got the hangman played by tim roth you've got a cowboy played by that guy who is in every tarantino film whose name i can never remember you've got bob the mexican literally that's his name and he's Played by another actor, I could not tell. For I kept hearing Rob Schneider, but I looked it up and I've never heard of the guy before. And you have an old Confederate general who's just sitting on his ass, waiting for the snow to pass. Now, it's quite clear that something else is going on inside of this, because even Kurt Russell says, the second he gets in there, something ain't right. And he starts interrogating them, even going as far as to disarm all of them and destroy their guns. And he's figuring that someone isn't telling them who everything. They're not telling who they really are. The people who normally run the place are missing and they left Senior Bob in charge. Which strikes Samuel and Jackson in particular very odd. Now to say anything beyond this point is basically ruining the movie. So I highly recommend, even if you do like my spoiler section that you might want to stop the video here and go see The Hateful Eight because if I say anything else here, it's going to ruin basically everything for you. So you have been warned. So as the tensions run high, Samuel Jackson apparently has a history with the said general who's just sitting on his ass minding his own business. They were in battle together on opposite sides, but they were in battle together. And it turns out that the Confederacy put quite a bit of a bounty on Samuel Jackson's head. Now, this is to be expected. I mean, after all, he was very effective what he did. And he did kill a lot of them. A lot. Now, it was revealed to us in a conversation prior that the old man is, wait is going to buy his supposedly dead son a tombstone. A ceremonious one. And he's just going to talk to the stone worker to see, carve what it says. Samuel Jackson reveals that, yes, your son is dead, and I killed him. But that's not all I did. And Samuel Jackson starts spinning this tale about how his son came after him for the bounty. Admittedly, the bounty had dropped to about five grand rather than its initial 30, and it was mostly just for bragging rights, but Samuel Jackson got the better of him, killed his company, and he found out who he, whose son he was, and decided to torture him first. Torture him. He strips him down to nothing but his snow boots, literally, and walks him in the snow of Wyoming until he can't walk anymore. <laughs> now, if that wasn't bad enough, when he finally collapses because of the cold, he starts begging for a blanket. And Samuel Jackson says, you want a blanket? Get over here. 
and he takes out his big black dick and makes the man suck it for his blanket. Remember that he's telling this to the guy's father. Now the whole hope here is that they establish that he couldn't, that Samuel Jackson couldn't just shoot the man because that would be illegal. He's doing it in front of the sheriff and him. So he left a gun at this guy's side and he's coaxing him into taking it. So we don't know whether or not this story is true but I guarantee you, this is like one of the best monologues I've ever heard Samuel Jackson give. And there's not a lot of a lot of you know freaking f bombs dropped or anything like that. No, this is just him delivering a great monologue by being Samuel Jackson. Eventually, the old general can't take it anymore, and he tries to go for the gun to shoot Samuel Jackson. And in Samuel Jackson's self-defense, he draws faster and shoots him. Meanwhile, now Samuel Jackson's story was just really, really engaging. Everybody in the room was focused on him. So no one noticed someone poisoned the coffee. And this is where you start to get the clue aspect of things. Where it's who did what, when, where, and why, and how. And the only one we know who is innocent for sure in all of this is Samuel Jackson. Anybody could have poisoned the coffee. Everyone had an opportunity. Everyone had basically everything. So, thus becomes the mystery. And it's a very engaging mystery. And then it comes into one of my negatives about the movie. Is that they don't let the mystery play out long enough. They basically tell you who did it, why, when, how, and what, within about 20 minutes of introducing it. And at that point, well, two people had already died from drinking the poison coffee in a, in a very, very graphic manner. I mean, literally like puking up blood and guts. It's pretty intense. And Samuel Jackson just basically puts everyone up against the wall with guns to their back and starts working it out. Now, this is where the movie gets to its best point. And by, by God, the cinematography on all of this has been beautiful. And it's also been very, very contained. They're all stuck inside of this one location, which is this house, this barn, this cabin. And they're stuck there. And, well, there's nothing else they can really do about that. Every single one of these characters has brought so much to the limelight that... Even through minimalistic dialogue from like Joe Gage, which is the guy who's in all Quentin Tarantino's films, whose name I can't remember. It really is a whodunit scenario that we are fully invested in because of how well established all of these characters are. We know their backstories, we know their backstories, we know how they think, we know how they operate. It really is just super engaging. And then the movie basically tells you twenty minutes after that. Who done it, why, and how. And this is probably the biggest failing of the movie right here. Which is, it was everybody. Except for Samuel L. Jackson and the sheriff. Now, at this point, Kurt, Kurt Russell and his driver, who are the other two people in the room, had died. As well as the Confederate soldier who had been shot by Samuel L. Jackson. They're all dead. So, who did it? Well, it was the three other guys who were inside of the room before they got there. They were all working in cahoots with each other. You get the idea of what he was trying, what Quentin Tarantino was trying to go for, but there's no mystery here, especially when it reveals that there's a ninth person in this room, played by Channing Tatum, who's sitting in the flo floorboards, who ends up shooting Samuel Jackson's nuts off. Because violence! And there was no clues establishing that he was there. There were clues about everyone else's identity. The lock on the door had been latched off. The shelf was clearly missing a thing of jelly beans. There were clear-cut clues that things had gone wrong. And that there was a setup here. But there was never any establishing clue that there was Channing Tatum in the fucking basement waiting to shoot them. Which raises the biggest question, which... I think that nobody really is acknowledging when they're putting this on their best movies of the year list that they had three guys up top 
had several opportunities where Kurt Russell was alone because this was all an attempt to free his captive. And there's a guy in the basement who could have shot them all. Why did we have to sit through that first two hours? There were so many opportunities they could have done this. I get that they want to do it a lot more subtly, but that poison was not subtle. They're puking up blood. It, they were actively moving around. It was quite clear <laughs> that they could have finished this a long time ago, and now everyone's dead because of it. And it makes no goddamn sense. Admittedly, I didn't notice any of this until I was really thinking about it after I left the theater, which is definitely to the movie's credit. But you have to realize that that whole scenario could have been a lot better. For what we got, I think it was really, really well done. The violence in this last third is mind-blowing. I mean, people's faces exploding. People getting shot with guts flying everywhere. Hell, Channing Tatum... After they, okay, so they they do a jump cut where they flash back and show you how they took over the place, which I think was probably a bad idea. You could have shortened that up and put it closer to the end of the film after everything, and then it would have been better. But I can understand Quentin Tarantino; he can do it his way. I get it. But somehow during that flashback, Samuel Jackson, after getting his nuts shot off, was able to get away to a bed where the sheriff who was the only other good guy in the whole hey he's been shot in the leg and he was able to pull everything of get the guys who aren't dead yet like tim roth who's sitting inside of a chair with a bullet in his stomach and joe gage who's moved across the room he somehow managed to get them all over there get the bed and chair set up and now they're demanding that can't Channing Tatum get the hell out of the floor and throw up his pistols? Why doesn't Channing Tatum just shoot them from under the floor? They know where he knows where they are, even if he can't see them. There's enough sound from all of them walking around. I'm just saying, there's ways around this. But Channing Tatum ends up coming up and has a nice heartfelt moment before getting shot in the back of the head by Samuel Jackson. Literally, his brain matter, it goes all over his sister who was the captain and it's like stick stuck there for the whole duration of the movie it, it gets really violent and that is engaging enough to keep me in there because yeah we're seeing we saw two hours of build-up and now we're seeing an hour of payoff so yeah i can honestly say that all of these nitpicks and all these situational things i'm not really considering them until after i get out of the theater which is a plus in the movie's favor, but I guess I could have to call it a minus overall. Because, yeah, that last third just kind of destroys the movie. Now, I don't want to take too long on this one, so I'm just going to put it like this. I still think this is one of the best films of the year. I do. It's still on my top ten list. But it was originally... I was thinking it was going to be like originally like three and such... It's probably closer to eight or nine, maybe maybe seven if I was giving it some good props there. The whole movie itself is very engaging. The characters are fully fleshed out and likable. You have actors who can portray them engagingly when they're literally doing nothing. And the final third is a very good payoff, if not for the fact that it doesn't make any sense. Although there is one other thing I want to touch upon that I think is probably another failing that I can understand someone not having the same problem with it as I did, but I felt that it just didn't, it's a missed opportunity to become full circle. So Samuel Jackson's side of this film has a letter from Lincoln, or supposedly, and it's a, made a big deal about it. And later in the film, it's revealed that the Lincoln letter is fake. Because why would Lincoln have a correspondence with a disgraced soldier who got kicked out of the mil military because his escape from a prison ended up killing inmates as well as Southerners? And he says, oh, well, I lie because black people are safest when white people are disarmed. 
and nothing disarms you better than that letter. Okay, but in the end, when everyone's basically dead and dying, which is how the movie ends, is all eight of these people end up either being outright killed or presumed dead because the sheriff and Samuel Jackson, the last two people, are bleeding to death from wounds they can't close. So, yeah. But in the end all of there, the one person who thought the letter was the fakest, and he's the one who brings it up, the sheriff, demands to see the letter before they all die. And he ends up reading it, and he says, oh, that's a good touch, that Mary Sherry bit. And they all have a good laugh before fade out. Why couldn't we have had one more second of that where Samuel Jackson reveals, yeah, the story I made up about the letter is fake. The letter itself isn't, though. It was my dad's. Or my brother's. Or a fellow soldier inside of his company. Why not ha bring that whole thing full circle? That, yeah, it was a cherished possession. It wasn't just a, a fake letter. I mean, God's sake, he punched a woman in the face out of a moving carriage, which dragged her captor out with her because she spit on it. Yeah, just so you know, random acts of violence towards the lady who's playing this captive, it's pretty damn funny. And yeah, I just feel that there was a chance to make it full comfort, full circle, and give some form of redemption to what are basically the heroes of the movie, and you missed it. I get it, we're not supposed to like these guys, they're all basically bad people, but it's just... Yeah, I just wish that it had to come full circle. Because, yeah, I was rooting for Samuel Jackson the whole time. And when it was revealed that the sheriff was... Yeah, he's a fucking racist bigot. But, yeah, he's still the only guy in the room you can trust. I was actually rooting for him, too. All in all, this movie has some flaws. You probably won't notice them unless you're actually looking for them. And the last third will probably bug you if you start thinking about it. But then again, there are problems with that in all of Quentin Tarantino's films. Hell, Django, and, Django Unchained? Why didn't they just buy back his wife and be done with it? Because it was wrong? These guys have killed for less, I'm just saying. So yeah, most of what I say problem-wise are more nitpicks about the film. And I still highly recommend that you go see this in the largest format possible. If you can find an IMAX showing this movie, by God, go see it in IMAX. You will not regret the money that you just spent on that. And that's it for me. Did you enjoy the video? Have you seen The Hateful Eight? Tell me what you thought about it in the comments below and maybe we'll get some healthy discussion going. And as always, if you liked what you see, be sure to check out the channel and hit the subscribe button. I want to see some of my more playlists, I'll have those up here. You want to see some of my more recent videos, I'll have those linked right down here. Be sure to like me on Facebook and follow me on Twitch. And I guess I'll see you all next time.